Hello and welcome to the special web series on the Goa Inquisition. The series introduces you to the most recent research produced by internationally recognized scholars. I am Dale Lois Menezes. Our guests will give you a glimpse of their research as well as the research that has taken place over the last half century. You will hear directly from the experts about the nature of state and religious violence as well as the challenges a historian faces in researching a difficult topic such as the history of the Inquisition. Our web series aims to educate the general public about the various aspects of this historical phenomena. The web series is supported by the Alzulej Collective in Goa. Additionally, the series is also supported by the History of the Inquisitions group, a group of scholars spread across the world with institutional support from the Center for Religious History Studies at the Catholic University of Portugal uh, and of the Alberto Benveniste Chair of the Shef of Shefardic Studies at the University of Lisbon. We thank all of them for their generous moral support. Our guest today for the last and final episode of the web series are Susana Bastos Matheus and Carla Costa Vieira. Susanna Matheus is a researcher at the Alberto Benveniste Chair of Shefardic Studies and a member of the History of Religious Studies at the Catholic University of Portugal. She is also the member of the History of the Inquisition's Research Group. Her research focuses on the impact of forced convergence on the first generation of new Christians, for instance, the impact on the Shefardic diaspora in the 16th century. Welcome, Susanna. Thank you, Leo. Our next guest is uh, Carla Costa Vieira, who's a researcher at SHAM, or the Center for the Humanities at the NOVA University in Lisbon, and also at the Alberto Benveniste Chair of Shefardic Studies at the University of Lisbon. She is currently developing her postdoctoral project titled Nation Between Empires, New Christians and the Portuguese Jews in Anglo-Portuguese relations in the first half of the 18th century, which is funded by the FCT. She is also the editor of the journal Cadernos de Estudos Shefarditas. Welcome to the series, Carla. Thank you, David. The episode today is a special one. We have two parts for this episode. In the second part, our guests, who are experts in their field of study, will demonstrate how an historian reads documents. This means that all you viewers will be able to see for yourself firsthand how the documents of an inquisitorial trial, the processors, as they are called, looked. Susanna and Carla are going to read for us the trial of Processor of Catarina Dorta, the sister of the great Dr. Garcia Dorta. We in Goa are familiar with him as his memory lives amidst us through the public garden in Panjim, the Jardin Garcia de Horta. So we look forward to familiarizing ourselves with an inquisitorial document and the manner in which an historian reads such documents. Part two, therefore, is a masterclass on how to read an old document, in this case, an inquisitorial document. Katharina de Horta, like her brother, was a new Christian. She was tried for Judaizing. That is to say that the Inquisition suspected her for harboring crypto-Jewish beliefs and practices. The text of the trial was recently published by uh, Susanna, Carla, and, and Miguel, uh, which is another reason why we decided to focus our last episode on the trial of Katharina de Horta. 
Katharina Daorta's life provides us with an important way to understand several issues or terms that frequently crop up in the inquisitorial documents, such as new Christians and crypto Jews. The scholarship on these issues and the people tried by the Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian inquisitions is vast, and perhaps it may have some important lessons to understand some aspects of the Goan case better. We cannot say exactly how and what aspects, as a lot of research still needs to take place in the future. As such, the first part of the interview, uh, uh, Susanna and Carla will provide a brief sketch about the life and trial of Katharina Dorta. We shall then dive a bit deeper into what these terms, New Christian and Crypto Jew, mean in the light of debates that, are taking, that have been taking place in Europe, America, and Latin America for the past 60 or 70 years. Let us start now with the first part. My first question to you is, could you very briefly provide us with some historical and contextual details about the life and trial of Katharina Dorta? I believe she was tried both in Europe and Goa, right? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, probably the most well-known detail about Katrina Dorta lives uh, is, uh, that uh, they have already has already mentioned is that the fact the fact that she was the sister of uh, Garcia Dorta, the famous Portuguese physician. Other details about her life, no comprehensive at all, mostly derived from her inquisitorial trials. Her, two inquisitorial trials in particular, the second one in 1568. Then at the moment of her arrest in Goa, Katarina was about 55 years old. This means that she was born about 1513 in Castel de Vite. Castel de Vite is in the center of Portugal near the Spanish border. Uh, her parents, Leonor Gomes and Fernão de Horta, were originally from Spain and had moved to Portugal in 1492 after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. A few years later, they faced the same situation in Portugal and then they were converted to Christianity. Therefore, they belonged to the first generation of Jewish converts in Portugal. Uh, so, Katrina and her siblings, including Garcia Dorte, uh, had already born and uh, been raised as Catholics. However, the Inquisition was only established in uh, 1536 when Katrina was a young woman. About this time, uh, she married Lionel Gonçalves in Castel de Vite, and some time later, they uh, moved to Lisbon, probably already with the aim of leaving Portugal and going to India. Uh, when Katrina was arrested for the first time in May of 1547, together with her sister, Violante Dorte, she was living in Lisbon and was mother of five children, including a newborn boy. Katrina and her sister were accused by their neighbors of not working on Saturdays and other behaviors that were connected to Judaism. And this first Katrina's trial did not include a sentence. So later she will tell that she and her sister ended up being freed without any penalty since it was proved that the accusation was false. After this first trial, Katrina did not take very long to leave Portugal. In March of 1549, uh, she set sail for Goa with her husband, children, as well as her mother and uh, another sister, Isabel de Horta. In Goa, she found her brother, Garcia de Horta, but she did not find the peace nor security. Uh, in the late 50s, the pressure over the new Christians in Goa increased. With, which culminated with the establishment of the Tribunal of the Inquisition in Goa. So the Ward uh, family was not immune to this uh, growing tension since the mid 60s. Uh, Katrina saw relatives being arrested by the Inquisition. And in October of uh, 60, 68, 
it was her turn. She had been denounced by a relative, Antonio Gomes, but later other accusations arrived at the Inquisition. Then her husband, Lionel Gonçalves, was also arrested in the meanwhile, uh, and this ended up compromising even more her situation since the inquisitors found some contradictions between their confessions and fully explored them. Also, with the passing of time, Katrina's confession became more and more inconsistent, often marked by uh, advances and setbacks, and the degradation of her case culminated with her condemnation. So on September uh, 25 of uh, 1569, Katrina died, burnt at the stake. And so this is uh, Katrina Dorta's life in, uh, in five minutes, <laughs> very briefly. Yeah, uh, could you maybe uh, elaborate on a bit about uh, how the trial took place in Goa, like why? What was the reasons why there were so many inconsistencies uh, in in their conf in their confessions or in their depositions? I believe, right? Yes. Uh, the The question is uh, because the trial uh, lasts a lot of time. So, what uh, the problem was that uh, Lionel Gonçalves, her husband. Uh, uh, the, the different confession and confession other practice and the other uh, uh, Jewish uh, offenses that well, supposed Jewish offenses that Katrina didn't confess. So then uh, their confessions uh, ended up being uh, uh, contradicted, and this is what ended up being uh, completely explored and by the inquisitors and this is um, mostly the, the main reason why, why Katrina uh, was condemned and uh, the inquisitors found that uh, her, uh, her confession was not complete and uh, was not true. Right and my, my next question is, uh, is relating to again who Katarina Dorta was uh, and since she was a new Christian, new Christian woman, could we remind our viewers who the new Christian Christians were? Well, in, when we talk about new Christians, we we, are talk, we can talk about two realities. The first one, a general one, we can talk about an individual who. who who is newly converted to Catholicism, in general terms, that is a new Christian. But for early modern historians, uh, there is uh, actually a consensus about the using of this kind of, of uh, term to refer to a specific um, religious minority, the Jewish minority, and also to a specific context and geographical, in ge geographical terms and also chronologically. So basically, we are talking about the Iberian Peninsula, and we are talking about uh, the, fourth, the late 14th century, mostly the 15th century, and maybe the first years of the 16th century. We are talking about uh, a violent reality of uh, expulsions, forced conversions, um, and also forced, forced individual uh, conversions, but also forced ma mass conversions. Um, so um, we have two key moments uh, to understand this social reality. I can uh, point out the, the year of 1492 with the expulsion of the Jews from Castile and Aragon. And uh, for instance, that is the framework of the Garcia Dort and Catania Dorta's family because they were descendants of these Jews expelled from Castile. Uh, and then the, the other key moment, it will be 1497, uh, 1496 with the, the decree of expulsion from, of the Jews from Portugal, but 1497 with the mass conversion of the Jews in Portugal. Uh, the problem of this kind of event, um, the abrupt and violent one, is that we have uh, 
like a, a change, a massive change in the social reality of the, the kingdom. We have a newly um, a new reality of new, these new Christians, newly converted, uh, with no no doctrination at all or very uh, incipient do doctrination to the Catholic faith. So we have um, a, a, a tension uh, situation in regarding this kind of population. And is this is one of the causes that will uh, bring so much problems in the 16th century and 17th century and so on regarding, for instance, the persecutions made by the Inquisitions. So, so there are these two, two ways to understand, uh, there are two paths basically to, to how to understand the new Christians. One is on an individual level, a, a person of Jewish heritage from, uh, from, um, from, the, from the kingdoms that comprise Spain who were expelled from 1492 and converted to Catholicism? They are the uh, they are the new Christians, but also it's it specifically refers to a historical process within the Iberian Empire, um, and 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 specifically to the late late 15th and the, and the 16th uh, 16th century. Uh, that that's that's the two parts just to just to uh, recap right yes and we can say that after uh, a wave of um, anti-jewish persecutions anti-jewish violence in europe uh, that started maybe in the 13th century mm -hmm. when we arrive at the end of the 14th century and also in the 15th century we arrive at the iberian peninsula we say these persecutions the Jews who were expelled for so many of so many kingdoms that they at some point they arrive and they stay in the Iberian Peninsula. So yes, we have uh, a specific reality uh, regarding this concept of new Christians uh, that is shaped in a chronological frame, specific framework uh, regarding the context, uh, geographical context of the Iberian Peninsula. Yes. Right, and and I think that gives a better sense of how to how to understand not just the term but even the the people who are associated with the term when we encounter them in say history books or or in documents. Um, my my next question is is again about a definition, and very often we hear the term crypto Jews, and uh, so. Who, who were the crypto Jews? Could you explain what crypto means here specifically? And I'm, I'm much interested to, uh, to unpack this, uh, this first half of the term crypto in crypto Jews. Yeah, uh, first of all, we should be aware that crypto Jews and crypto Judaism are not uh, consensual concepts. Sometimes crypto too is abusively used, even endorsing the Inquisition's narrative itself. And in the same way, uh, it tends to be confused with New Christian. And Sun has already explained who the New Christians were. And the fact is that crypto too has a different meaning. When we, we use the expression crypto, crypto too, you are assuming that this person secretly keeps a set of beliefs or rituals or uh, practice related to Judaism at the same time that she or he or, or he lives uh, and behaves as a Christian in the in his or her public life. So, actually, what the information, uh, the, uh, what the sources uh, give us, mainly inquisitorial records. Rarely or maybe never is a great enough to conclude that someone is indeed a secret Jew or not. The here crypto is secret, secret Jew or not. However, the crypto Judaism was a reality to the extent that the Inquisition fed for centuries this idea of the persistence of uh, secret Judaism among the new Christians. 
So also the, the type of uh, beliefs, behaviors and practice that the Inquisition associated to the crime of Judaizar in Portuguese, Judaizing, uh, did not uh, change a lot since its early times. They mostly followed what was settled already in 1536 in the so-called uh, Monitorio Geral, a list of heretical actions and offenses that should be denounced to the Inquisition at the time of uh, the establishment of the, the, the tribunal. Namely, this, uh, this practice, these uh, actions, who in the case of the, the, the Judaism or the Judaizar, was the observance of uh, the Shabbat and some Jewish holidays and fasts, as uh, Pesha and Kippur, for, ex for instance, uh, the dietary laws, in other words, not eating pork, not eating shellfish, and so on. Uh, some funeral rituals, the circumcision, keeping the Jewish prayer books or Torahs, and so on. What is uh, interesting at, is that uh, we find this practice, some of this practice in Katrina the Orta's trial, as well as we will find the same practice in other trials, for, in, for instance, in the 18th century, very time later. Uh, so a little change it, little change it. Uh, so in a nutshell, uh, crypto Judaism has a religious meaning, while New Christian is more... Uh, ethnic, even uh, racial grounded label. Uh, it's, it, they are uh, different concepts, but sometimes uh, they are uh, erroneously uh, merged, but uh, they are different concepts. Okay, so so I just needed some clarification. So who, who coined the term crypto Jew? Is it a coinage of the inquisition did they use the term or was it a later term used by say historians or or in general discussions in in the public sphere uh, we we don't find the the term crypto true there is no crypto true in the inquisitorial records or in the other uh, historical sources at the time it's uh, I, I don't know when the concept was coined, but uh, it was it was later. It's uh, it's used later by uh, by historiography. You know, I don't know if uh, some have more information about about this. I think the term translate it's a translation for the of the nineteenth century and more in the early twentieth mm -hmm. century. Um, with the, this kind of uh, discovery, as it was uh, coined at the time, of some uh, Jewish, so-called Jewish communities in the interior of Portugal, because in, and it translates uh, this, the term of the Inquisition. It, it was more more like secret Jew or mm. occult Judaism. This kind of uh, terminology, not the crypto one. Uh, so it will be a, a, a cons uh, conceptual construction of uh, a, another reality, important reality for the studies about uh, Sephardism and the Jewish communities mm -hmm. in the Iberian Peninsula in, in the 19th century and the early 20th century. So basically, there were some communities that that were that were found despite despite the whole history of persecution and so some it had to be someone had to make sense of how they how they survived all this right and and this was some kind of an explanation is, is that is that is that what i is that right yeah when when some um, individuals uh, discover <laughs> and i mm -hmm. use this term well uh, it's it's not a really a discovery mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know yeah, uh, we yeah. are talking about sim the, the 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 symbolic concept of a discovery of these occult communities the survivors of so uh, they create a, a genealogy mm. uh, from the first ones so the first converted jews or uh, the first in the 15th century or in the beginning of the 16th century to the 20th century of course, historiography right now has many issues with 
this kind of genealogy and Carlo was talking about, of course, um, we have, it's important to understand the chronology of things. We cannot think that an individual uh, or, or a religious reality uh, remains untouchable for so many centuries uh, with no connections, with no changes, with no interaction with other realities. But it's a very important and symbol symbolic um, narrative uh, about this, uh, the identity of a part of Portugal because at the time there was a profound uh, um, and the, uh, there was no understanding about this kind of uh, reality in the history of Portugal, of the Portuguese uh, reality. So it was an important issue to this kind of narrative. Right. And I take your point uh, about how uh, the process, you know, the chronology as well as like the historiographical process uh, took place. Uh, uh, still, so, so crypto... Jew is again a very specific term um, applied within a specific Iberian context, whether in Iberia or or also in the overseas empire, right? Uh, but but it also has many meanings. Um, does is that a problem for his for historians that it has these many meanings, or could we sometime is it possible to pin it down? Uh, in, in, in certain, in one way or, or, or perhaps a few more ways? Is it is it possible to say something concrete with these concepts? Well, I think, well, I think it's, in, it's, a, it's a very problematic concept. Uh, historiography in the mid uh, 20th century and also until the 80s, more or less, uh, used this concept as a very um, import, struct, uh, structural one. So you find in many important studies about Inquisition or Inquisition and New Christians, the use of the term crypto Jew. As in two ways, two different and very uh, antagonical ways. One, that uh, re reality that is unquestionable. So in, it was like Carlo was saying before, sometimes also with a kind of a equivalence between new Christian and crypto Jews. So all new Christians must be crypto Jews. <laughs> and this is very dangerous because in some ways we, we were, or the historians that were making these studies or these assumptions were uh, and maybe unconsciously reproducing also the inquisitorial discourse because the Inquisition uh, sustained that all new Christians were uh, in, a, in a way uh, possibly crypto Jews and enemies of the Christianity and Catholicism. The other way it was saying that no, denying absolutely with no question this the use of this term because it was a fiction constructed by the Inquisition itself. So uh, the, the next generation of historians uh, in the beginning of the 20, 21st century will have uh, very, um, some difficulties in using this term and, uh, we're, and we're trying to make studies about new Christians, but uh, not about the religiosity of the new Christians, about other aspects of the life of new Christians, social aspects, uh, economic ones, etc. And right now we are trying to uh, have a more dense analysis of the term crypto Jew, or not using it or not, but uh, the important thing is have a more dense and more complex and problematic analysis of the religiosity of the new Christians and of the, the people who were tried by the inquisitions. Um, so I think we are uh, in the middle of this kind of uh, changing in the historiographical terms. So, so I have, uh, in, in relation to what you said, I have like one final question 
Uh, and again, it's, it's relating to crypto and perhaps I'll be repeating a few things that you've already said. So what you, what you said, uh, and, and I'm asking this question precisely because that crypto bit might have some, uh, have some use for us in, in understanding the Goa case better. Although, of course, a lot of research needs to happen on the beliefs, cosmologies, and religious practices of those who were tried by the Goa Inquisition. Um, of course, you're not specialist in Goan history, so we shall not, uh, uh, so we shall only uh, focus on the meaning of, uh, fo focus and explore a little more of the meaning of crypto in the context of uh, Shephardic Jewish history. And as you just mentioned, those two models, one of the models uh, was, uh, was that it looked, uh, it considered all Judaizers as, as uh, as simply good Christians who made made mistakes, right? So, uh, and and the other model was uh, uh, and the other other interpretation of new Christian was that Jews who had converted always had a yearning to go back to their original religion. Uh, thus, instances wherein new Christians left Portugal and Spain for places like the Ottoman Empire and and Cochin or Goa where they could network with other Jewish people was proof of this yearning. The fact that many of the new Christians got tried by the Inquisition, especially in Goa, were, was further proof of the new Christians wanted to go back to their Jewish fold. So in a sense, the Inquisition in both these uh, interpretation works in the role of a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy or a feedback loop, right? But as you just said, these, 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 both these models are not uh, not enough to explain uh, the complexity of who a new Christian was or who a crypto Jew was. Um, and, and you also mentioned about the non-religious aspects of their history. So could you, could you reflect a little more on why, why these older interpretations are not, not, not enough? Yes, I think it's a very important question for us, uh, for all historians that are making uh, today uh, history about new Christians in general, or the new Christian diaspora, etc. It's a very, very important uh, topic to reflect on. And, and it's a very difficult one. And the problem uh, that will well, uh, repeat it again, but the problem is that for so many years, through the historiography were uh, like um, froze in this dichotomy so difficult to to use between the two aspects you already mentioned and we are trying uh, and some important studies are being made right now trying to surpass this kind of dichotomic analysis and when we do that, uh, we, got, we don't have to run away from the religious questions and we can um, use it and we can analyze it in a more complex way, as we should do when we are talking about religious identities. Because uh, you, I, I think so, I think we can maybe one day when studies are being made in more a uh, more substantial way, we can also compare realities, uh, maybe also with, with the case of Goa. It's such a complex and important uh, case to compare with other realities. And also, for instance, some the Christians in Japan is another uh, important reality to compare. A part of the problem is um, some, the historiography, when uh, debating the case of the so-called crypto Judaism, uh, tends to to analyze it like an essential identity that remain uh, the same through time. And what the studies are showing us is also in the first generations, and even families that uh, live a part of their lives in Judaism. So for instance, the father was a forced converted man in 1497, or also the, and the, the, ma the mother, I don't know. And for instance, in the case of the Orta family, it's very, very uh, near the forced conversion. Uh, we can see that they 
were living in another reality because there was a destruction of the Jewish life, Jewish normal life. So even if they were or not, and we cannot know for sure if they were seeker Jews and really believe in Judaism or not, but we know for sure that even if that was the case, that Judaism were not the same they were living in before the forced conversion. And for me, this is the key, um, as one of the key aspects of this kind of studies. We should understand that religious identity are very fluid, very changeable in time, in geographical terms also, because if a family changes for, from the Iberian Peninsula to Goa, it will be another reality, complete, completely different. And that has uh, consequences in the religious identity they have. Thank you for that. And, and I, you have to forgive me. I'm just going to like repeat some of the main points that you made uh, just so that I know that I've got it right and hopefully it will benefit our viewers too. So um, you started by saying it's a very difficult problem. It's a diff difficult conceptual problem uh, because for one, when the historiography had started, presumably from the 19th century, when scholars were trying to make sense of who a crypto Jew was, uh, Jew the Jewish identity was considered as an essential identity that had not changed over time, that had not changed at all over the last 500 years, right? And, and this, is some, this is a point that uh, we've tried to make across in, in this series, in our previous episodes as well, that it is very important to take, take into consideration change over time. In fact, this is what historians are, this is the basic thing that historians, the one and the only thing that historians try to explain to, to, our, to our audience, right? And, and, and secondly, it's not possible to know for sure whether they practiced Judaism in secret, right? Whether they were secretly Jews, right? The, I, I guess at this point, we, we need to think about the interiority, what really lies some inside a person, right? And, and the third, third issue was that even if they did practice Judaism in secret, that was not necessarily the Judaism of the original Judaism of 1492, right? In that moment. So that Judaism was not frozen. In fact, even the secret Judaism, if at all it existed, had probably changed over time. And finally, that religious identities are fluid and one shouldn't take them as set in stone. So, 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 so thank you. That, that brings us to the end of our uh, part one. And I think we have covered a lot of conceptual ground uh, as far as how to understand particular aspect of inquisition, in, in, inquisitorial history uh, in, in Portugal or, or in Goa. Uh, let us now move to the second part, uh, and and this is obviously the part where uh, both of you would help us to uh, would demonstrate how a historian reads a, doc a document. But before uh, before we do that, uh, I would like to request you to introduce your Seri Goana project in which the trial was uh, published uh, recently, and this was published by. Uh, you, you both of you worked on it, but also your, your colleague, uh, Miguel Rodriguez Lorenzo, who, 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 we, had, who we met uh, in episode five. And uh, if any of the viewers haven't watched it, I would highly recommend that you do so as soon as possible. So could you, uh, could you introduce very briefly what this project is about? Why is it called Serigoana and so on? Uh, so the, the book about which we are talking today, the process, o Processo de Catarina de Horta, na Inquisição de Goa, is part of an editorial project uh, undertook uh, by uh, the Catra de Estudos Ferditas Alberto Benveniste uh, since the 2018, the collection Uspoe, or Uspoe Collection. Uh, the Uspe question uh, has the, the name inspired in two main figures of the Sephardic diaspora, 
uh, Samuel Luzque, the author of the Consolação às Tribulações de Israel, the Consolation for the Tribulations of Israel, and also uh, Abraham Luzque, the publisher of this masterpiece of the Sephardic literature. Uh, the Luzque collection uh, is, uh, its uh, main objective is to publish uh, documents uh, related to the Sephardic diaspora and the history of the new Christians in Portugal and the world. Uh, and the first volume was the, this uh, Livro dos Acordos of the Portuguese, uh, Sephard, the Portuguese Jewish Congregation of Amsterdam, of Amsterdam that wa, uh, was transcribed and published by, edited, edited by Maxim Kerkhoff. It's the first volume, actually, they are two volumes, but it's the first, uh, it was the first uh, edition of uh, Coleção Usque. And Coleção Usque is the, it also comprises uh, the Guana series, in which the Processo de Cedrina Duarte was, uh, was published. And uh, now Sun will talk a little more about this series, Guana. Well, the, the Guana series, the Seriguana, uh, was an, uh, an idea of our colleague Miguel Rodrigues Lorenz that you already met in another episode of this series. And, and the idea behind the, this, this series is uh, the importance of all um, the survival records of the Goan Inquisition uh, that we can find, because uh, as we are, you already know, the, the, the archive was destroyed, so it's, it's pre precious information for historians. So Miguel had the idea that um, you, the, to use the surviving trials that were uh, copied and sent to Lisbon uh, for different kinds of reasons, uh, that we can uh, then we should make a series on the trials against new Christians and with a paleographic transcription and a critic uh, edition of the document and an introduction, etc. So we have the first volume is the trial of Caterina Dorta and was made by Miguel, Carl, and I. And right now we are we are working on another four volumes, <laughs> four trials, uh, four uh, pieces of uh, inquisitorial records uh, regarding the uh, 16th century. So this decade, the 60s, and also until the end of more or less until the end of the 16th century. And the idea is to bring uh, on board, let's say other scholars that work about Goa and the social context of uh, uh, the so-called Estado da India and also Asia, uh, in Portuguese empire in general, to produce some uh, analytical uh, frameworks about new Christian presence in, in Goa and in Asia in general. It's more or less this idea and let's hope next year to have more maybe two volumes of this collection. Well, that, that, sounds, uh, that sounds great. And, uh, and it's important work, especially because the, uh, the archive was, uh, was burnt in the 19th century. And so we have to hold on to whatever, uh, whatever is left. Uh, um, we've come to the final bit of, of, the, of, the, of the interview um, and what remains is for, for, for both of you to tell us how, how a historian or demonstrate how a historian um, reads a document. So yeah, over to you. Uh, before we talk uh, about the inquisitorial records in themselves, uh, we find it, that it could be interesting to know a little more uh, where to find them and how they are organized at present. In the case of the Portuguese Inquisition, 
the great majority of the records are concentrated in the in one collection, preserved in one archive, the Arquivo Nacional de Torre de Tom, the National Archives uh, in Lisbon. The Tribunal do, do Santo Oficio, uh, the Holy Office Tribunal uh, Fonts, is divided into several sub fonts uh, corresponding to the different tribunals operating uh, uh, in the Portuguese, in Portuguese uh, territories, as well as uh, sub fonts uh, with records of the Conselho Geral de Santo Oficio the centralizing and ruling uh, body of the Portuguese Inquisition. So there are three sub funds uh, regarding the, the three uh, main tribunals, uh, permanent tribunals in Portugal, uh, Lisbon, Coimbra and Évora, and also three very small, very small funds uh, with records from uh, three short-term uh, courts that uh, operated in the early times of the Inquisition in Portugal, the Mil, Porto, and Tomar. Each of the of these collections are divided in uh, series and sections. In the case of the Conselho Geral, is divided in uh, several series uh, with several documentation uh, related to the current. Uh, operations of the of this body with correspondence, edits, forms, memorials, and so on. Uh, the records of the Inquisition of Cuba, it's at present incorporated both in the Conselho uh, Geral subfonds, but also in, mainly in the Inquisition of Lisbon subfonds, the trials of the Inquisition of Goa, the few trials of survival at present, uh, are in the Inquisition of uh, Lisbon uh, collection. So uh, these uh, subfonds of the tribunals of the Inquisition are divided into sections. Uh, one with records regarding the Inquisition staff, the Ministro and Oficiais, the Inquisition officers, and other sections, Juiz do Fisco, uh, with records of the court for the confiscation of assets of the defendants. Then the, these uh, subfonds also are also composed of uh, several series of documentation. Uh, one of them, the, the process, the trials, the trial series in which we will find the, uh, the trials of the Inquisition. Uh, as you can see here, the one, one, uh, one of the, the good news in this, in this, in this case is the, the fact that the, the inquisitorial trial, trials of the Inquisition of Lisbon, of the collection of the Inquisition of Lisbon, are all of, are al almost all available online for consultation in the Arquivo Nacional de Tocotombo database, the Digitarc. And now we are looking a little how to search information uh, on these, these trials. Uh, we have two options to search. We can search, do a simple search uh, by keywords or date, date range, or you can uh, do a advanced search and then uh, working and uh, searching in the structure fields of the description of the records. So for instance, we can uh, search by reference code, by uh, uh, if you if you, you know the reference code of the documentation, of, of course, uh, but also by title. For example, for example, if we are looking for the for Katrina Dorte trial, you we'll, you will type here in this box Katrina Dorte, and then you have the, the results uh, uh, of the trials uh, against uh, Katrina Dorte. Uh, you can also type the a date range to to search. Uh, and uh, maybe the most interesting uh, field, the scope and content. The scope and content field is not available uh, directly in the, in the page of uh, advanced search. You have to uh, click in search other fields and then select, select, select the scope and content. 
and then uh, the scope and content have the basic information about the record. In the case of the trials, uh, it has uh, information about the, the defendant and the information about the, the trial itself, the date of imprison, imprisonment, the sentence, but also uh, personal information about the defendant, the age, the, uh, the family, the residence. So if we, we want to search information, we can type in the scope and content uh, some keywords that we can find here. We have, we must be, you should be aware that these these descriptions are all in Portuguese. So we have to search with, with Portuguese uh, terms, not in English. If you if you if you if you we type here uh, new Christian or uh, or should they, we have no results at all. <laughs> we have to put Christonov and Judaism. For instance, here I put uh, Goa, Castel de Vid, and Christanova, New Christian. So, so I'm looking for Katarina. And then uh, if I uh, click in search, you, you'll have uh, two results, two, two pieces of uh, Katarina Dort uh, trial here. Uh, and then if you have if you have more results, you can also apply some filters uh, by date or if you want to, to see uh, records with digital representation or without presentation. And then if you, we, we click in the, in the image, uh, we'll have uh, access to, to the digital copy of the, the document. We, we, but it's great for us <laughs> uh, researchers to have this information. However, uh, we can download the, the, the record, but only one image <laughs> at, at the time, not uh, all the, the trial. Uh, and so this is uh, basically the some tips to, to search information in the the Kivu Nacional de Tocotum and uh, about in the Inquisition uh, uh, collection. I know, yeah. I know so, we'll... Uh, so so uh, now we know how to search it, but let's let's find out how to read it, right? <laughs> First, we need to learn the language uh, and then the handwriting, of course, but yeah. Uh, let me, let me share the, share the screen. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, the first problem regarding this kind of documents is the handwriting. <laughs> we should have, should have some kind of understanding of this, some kind of paleographical knowledge, or wait until we publish all the trial, the remaining trials <laughs> of the Goan Inquisition <laughs> and read our books. Um, so, well, uh, we should have to but, take but, but but even even if you have uh, the published trials the transcriptions it's still advisable to always look at the original documents right because there might be something the way things are written the way things are deleted or marginalia all these are in all this can be important information even if we have a transcription Right. Well, it's true. I have to say, and well, it's some kind of publicity, but uh, our colleague Miguel Rodriguez Lorenz, when he conceived the Goan series, the Seriguana, um, we, he was very uh, strict regarding the transcription uh, norms. So in our transcri transcription, you have all these indications you are a mention of marginalia, of uh, also deleted words, change words, etc. Uh, we have to take into account in this specific case, and I will mention it uh, after a little bit after that we are working not with the original document because that one was destroyed, but with a copy made um, to uh, to send to Lisbon. So it's a different um, document. Uh, that uh, regarding the original ones that we have for the, the Lisbon Inquisition, for instance. We can uh, start. 
So here, uh, for example, we have um, the first uh, page of the Lisbon trial of Catarina Dorta, that one that Carla, uh, as mentioned before, the, the trial of 1547. This one is the original one. So in the middle of this trial, you have the handwriting, you have the, the different handwritings of all the individuals that are, were involved in the trial. Uh, you, uh, we have to take into account that we are working with uh, trial records. So uh, we have juridical terms, we have a structure, a very strict structure that changed uh, through time because uh, inquisitorial regulations also changed. Uh, in the time of Catarina Dorta, we, we have uh, the regulations, the first regulations of the Portuguese Inquisition of 1552. And the structure of the trial was still uh, in construct, under construction, let's say it. But in general terms, the trial started with the denunciation. So to the inquisitors, people denunciate some religious, suspicious practice. And with these uh, elements, this, uh, they, the inquisitors compiled all the accusations and created the first um, uh, formal accusation against a person. And uh, it, we have in the next image um, an example of the accusation that the inquisitors in Lisbon made against Caterina de Orta. Um, it, and basically it's, well, what Carla was mentioned before is uh, that the, she should make some Jewish practice with her sister, very simple and very, as you can see, like two paragraphs of an accusation. Yeah, over here, that is the word, right? Judaizers. Exactly. And uh, exactly. Yeah, against uh, uh, holy faith. Holy so, so faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the second line, you can see that she was uh, respecting the, the Shabbat. Uh, in Portuguese, you can see guardando so, sabbat. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. And after, like a Jew, como judia, uh, you have the, this... Uh, well, it's inquisitorial language uh, because they mm -hmm. they are formulating this kind of um, images of what Jewish practice uh, was. Then, uh, well, this trial is a very brief one. I, I prefer to to show the Goan trial uh, in the next image, and you have the first page of the trial and our the, the, the cover of our book. Um, hopefully, we will have the book translated into English. Uh, let's hope next year, so it will be easy also for uh, um, a more broad uh, public to uh, have uh, access to the trial. Uh, is this the Caterina Dorta signature on the cover of the book? Uh, yeah, that's the problem. No, it's no. the signature of the the person who made the copy. Oh. <laughs> it's Caterina Dorta, but as it is a copy, the scribe made uh, made the. the oh, signature. okay, okay. Uh, so he copied her. He, he kind of forged her signature, isn't he? <laughs> it's he more or less. Okay, exactly. okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that's the problem we have with the go this remaining go, uh, Goan trials, they were copies made to St. Lisbon. So mm -hmm. you don't have actually the diversity of and writings, um, of hesitations of the, the different scribes, you know, as you have in the original trials uh, for people, for colleagues that study and writing or things like mm -hmm. that. It, they cannot do this kind of studies with this document in particular. So you have the formal accusation and then you will have, um, well, the arrest. And you can see in the next image. So this is 
you can see <laughs> the handwriting of the scribe is very good one for the 16th century, I should say. And here you have the words entrega, and uh, is when she was uh, incarcerated. So she was delivered to prison, to the prison guard. And, uh, and uh, down you have uh, the first session. So after she was arrested, she was incarcerated. And then uh, the inquisitors uh, made the first session, the first uh, interrogation session. Uh, in, the, in this case of Catarina Dorte, there were many sessions because, uh, as Carla had explained, there were some doubts about the declarations, there were some inconsistencies regarding the declarations of her, the confessions of her husband. So you have like six, seven sessions, and then in the end of the trial, she again confessed, she um, declines the confession, the confession, and she confesses again. So it's a very complex uh, trial in this case. But usually you have uh, a number of sessions with the interrogation sessions. In later years, you will have a more structured uh, trial record. And after the arrest, after the incarceration, you will have two important uh, sessions for the for historians. The first one is the inventario, the inventory. So you have um, a list, uh, a declaration of the assets, assets that the person had. And this is very important also for studies on cultural history or material mm. uh, aspects of uh, daily life also. And then you have another important session that is the genealogy session. Where, pers or where the people, the, the pr prisoner will declare all family connections. And that can, it's very useful for us in order to uh, try and to place a person in a network, a familiar network, commercial network, etc. So you have, as I said, a lot of interrogations and then uh, after the, these formal accusations are built, so, so just the, just before we go yes. ahead, what is the what is the word that you've circ circled over here it, in green? Is you have a number one, and uh -huh. then session session. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So who made the copy are is uh, identifying the different parts of the trial. This one is the first. Uh, um, the, the moment where Katerina for the first time is uh, dealing with the, the questions of the inquisitors. Then you have a possibility of some kind of defense. So you have uh, here is a Another important piece of the trial uh, where uh, the defendant and the, the attorney of the defendant can present some witnesses of defense, some also some ar arguments of defense. The, uh, we can see the word contrariando, like, the term is contraditas, because it's like a contradictory uh, moment. So where she is um, trying to, yes, and trying yeah. to prove that the accusations are false and why they are false. So it's this uh, kind of moment. When uh, they have, um, the inquisitors are, have some doubts of the veracity of uh, the confessions or if the defendant remains without uh, making a, what they call the true confession, they can use sometimes torture to trying to have more easy confession. After all these uh, moments, we have the first uh, publication of the sentence. And you can see that in the next image. I think this is, sorry. 
this is the, the, the list of defense witnesses. We can see it here. What does it say? Over, it says testimonies para a defesa atrás. So uh, she made that uh, argumentation in her defense, and she is presenting a list of uh, witnesses that can uh, uh, certify the argument she presents. And now it's, we arrive at the moment where the inquisitors present the first, what they call the first publication of the sentence. So they are saying, your trial is in this stage. And right now, uh, yes, you can see here, very uh, difficult to see, is for primeira publicação, first publication. So it's like a menace in a way, because they are saying, with the confession you made, with the doubts we have, this is the sentence we are proposing. Mm. And usually it's that sentence <laughs> because they are trying to show the defendant that if he or she does not confess fully, she uh, is at risk of dying or mm. be condemned to death. So did this this would be published as an announced outside in the city square or something like that. Yes, right? but in, re in reality is internally because they are in fact reading the sentence to the defendant. It's so that's like it. That's all. Public sound. Just that's what it means. Right. They are not making a public statement. They are making a publication for the defendant. They are reading it to her. In the case of Catalina. Uh, you see, uh, we are, this is your sentence. You will be condemned like this for the crimes you have committed, etc. Then uh, so, they uh, are- before, before, is it, is everything so, so densely packed in, is it because it's a copy or like an original trial would have like more paper basically, is that what I'm asking? Or original trial will have much more paper uh, uh -huh. more space between more space. different um, sessions, different moments, different end writings. This one is a copy, so he is making it very narrow, very, very and tightly then, packed. Yeah. Um, afterwards, uh, they make an identification of the different pieces in order to read it better. Mm -hmm. So, in in fact, this kind of uh, identification is made afterwards. For us, it's good because you can easily, more or less easily identify. Oh, okay. So, so the book, so the bookmarks are kind of added later, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Just to separate sections of the yeah, of because the process. As, as we can see, it's all very dense. At the end, writing is very, very dense. Right. Right. Should I should I go to the next slide? Uh, yes. Well. Then we have, maybe we will have more confessions until we arrive at the final sentence. And what we have here is the final sentence of Caterina Dorta. You have, it, the mark is an abbreviation of the word in Portuguese, sentença. This one. And, right. and this one is the final one. So you have the conclusion of the trial. In the case of Catherine, as we already mentioned, uh, the sentence was uh, uh, sentenced to, to death. And we, we have it here. In the next, uh, here is the, the term of execu the execution moment. So uh, they are saying that she was uh, sent to the Auto de Fe, uh, and she was delivered to the secular and bras quar, as it was the term uh, that the Inquisition uses to uh, express the, the final sentence, the sentence to death. And so, if uh, it was the case that Caterina wasn't condemned to death, as in the first tri trial, for example, the trial of Lisbon, in Lisbon, she, she would be condemned other. Uh, to perform other things, for instance, spiritual penances, uh, wearing the penitential garment, or uh, made 
public abjuration of her faith mis uh, errors uh, to be a different final, uh, co different conclusion of the trial. In this case, the conclusion is this one. All right, thank you so much for, for, for reading the document uh, for us. And uh, um, it, was, it was fascinating to see how, how not just uh, not historians in general work, but since you had worked on the trial, how, how, how you worked and how you read the, read the document. So thank you again for that. Um, we, are, we are at the end of the, of the episode and uh, very quickly, I think we, we, we went through uh, what, uh, uh, we went through the life of Katharina Dorta, how she was tried. Uh, we spoke about the new Christians, who they were, how, how, how they were identified, how historians think about that. Them. And, and in a related way, we also spoke about the crypto, crypto Jews and, and we've already uh, spoke up, spoke, spoken about them and, and the problems with the term at length earlier. So I won't, I won't repeat it again. And finally, we've just seen, seen, the, seen how, how historians read a, read a document, a very technical document, a legal document here uh, of, of the trial of Katharina Dorta. So before, before we end, uh, I would like to once again thank all our guests uh, Bruno Feitler, Angela Barreto Xavier, Ana Canas da Cunha, José Pedro Paiva, Miguel Rodrigues Lorenzo, Celia Tavares, Patricia Souza de Faria, and last but not the least, our guests for today, Susana Bastos Mateus and Carla Costa Vieira. You all gave your valuable time and inputs, and in doing so, have enriched us intellectually. And on a personal note, it is always a pleasure to read documents with fellow historians. So, Carla, Susanna, thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the Alzaledge Collective, I thank the Sephardic Studies Center, the Catholic University of Portugal, and the History of the Inquisitions Research Group for your moral support. And finally, to all our viewers, it's been quite a long journey. So thank you. Muito obrigado. Anindio Barekuru.